Hello, my name is Chris Dedarian. I'm one of the pediatric and fetal surgeons in the Colorado Fetal Care Center at Children's Hospital Colorado. Today I'm going to talk to you about fetal growth restriction. I'd like to start off with telling you what fetal growth restriction is. It refers to poor in utero growth and is defined by a fetal weight below the 10th percentile for a given gestational age. It's important because it affects 10 to 15 percent of pregnancies worldwide and accounts for nearly 50 percent of stillbirths. Offspring may suffer from neurodevelopmental, immunological, and multi-organ sequelae. Adult sequelae of fetal growth restriction include obesity, mental health disorders, cardiovascular disease, and even strokes, to name a few. In addition, these fetuses are at increased risk of prematurity and the associated complications. Risk factors for fetal growth restriction are broadly grouped into maternal, fetal, and placental. And specific examples include maternal malnutrition, substance abuse during pregnancy, high altitude pregnancies, and even placental disorders. It's believed that the pathogenesis culminates in impaired oxygen and nutrient delivery to the fetus, independent of which one of those prenatal insults affects it. Despite several defined risk factors, approximately two-thirds of cases are idiopathic. And among these, nearly half have histologic evidence of reduced trophoblast invasion into the placenta and insufficient fetal placental angiogenesis. I think one of the challenges with studying fetal growth restriction is that the pathogenesis of it has already happened at the time of diagnosis. And so the insults preceded the time that we diagnose it. And this makes human studies infeasible. Several researchers have proposed various animal models for fetal growth restriction. But one of the challenges with this model is that it's only one of many risk factors for fetal growth restriction. Thus, the question arises, are findings using a mouse model of cal a caloric restriction mouse model applicable to human disease? And I really think the verdict's still out for this one. So what do we think the cause of fetal growth restriction is? Well, we know that fetal growth restriction results in impaired nutrient and oxygen delivery to the fetus. We also know that when you examine pathologic specimens of growth-restrictive placentas, they have reduced trophoblast invasion into the uterine wall, as well as reduced fetoplacental angiogenesis. I speculate that various risk factors impair these processes, uh, these invasive and angiogenic processes, resulting in fetal growth restriction. And in my lab, we study microRNAs. So microRNAs are short non-coding RNAs that are composed of approximately 18 to 22 nucleotides. They regulate gene expression at the post-transcriptional level by targeting and binding to messenger RNAs. This binding then in turn promotes mRNA degradation or suppression. And thus, if you think about it, microRNAs really work in an inhibitory fashion. So they inhibit their target um, mRNAs. And we hypothesize that unique microRNAs that regulate molecular processes associated with placental invasion and angiogenesis are dysregulated in fetal growth restriction. In my lab, we use both human placental tissue and animal models to study these altered molecular processes. When do I think we'll have therapeutics to treat fetal growth restriction? I think we're a ways off. Before implementing therapeutics, we need to understand molecular mechanisms behind the disease, Nevertheless, the goal within my lab is to really establish causality between microRNAs and these pathologic changes seen in fetal growth restricted placentas. Despite the work that still needs to be done, this is a disease process with tremendous long-term health implications and one that creates substantial strain on the healthcare system. Treatments need to be developed, and I think our lab is on the forefront of understanding the pathogenesis. If you have any further questions, please reach out.